Okay, today I'm pleased to introduce John Morris. John is the first author that has, this, that has to us a finger pop, so he has that honor for sure. <laughs> He's also been writing humor and culture-related content for more than a decade. His long-running blog on failed, ignored, or just plain weird comic books, Gone and Forgotten, contains more than 800 entries on the abandoned and dusty corners of the comic book biz. Not only did John score an appearance on This American Life to discuss what makes a superhero fail to catch the popular imagination, but it also provided the foundation for his first book, The League of Regrettable Superheroes, published by Quirk Books of Philadelphia. And that led to the book he's here to discuss today, The Legion of Regrettable Supervillains. Please join me in giving John a warm welcome. Thank you very much. That's good. I like that applause. Uh, my name is John Morris. I'm the author of The Legion of Regrettable Supervillain. It's a collection of more than 100 of the weirdest, the wildest, and the most underrated supervillains in comic book history, uh, and is the successor to the book The League of Regrettable Superheroes, which did the same thing for the good guys. And as mentioned, I've been writing the blog Gone and Forgotten for 20 years this year. It's an anniversary. Uh, <laughs> And all of that has served to make me a walking encyclopedia of weird comic book knowledge, which is a direct middle finger to my college education. <laughs> Tough luck, mom and dad. You scrimped and saved for nothing. Uh, this also is my second visit to a Google campus. I actually visited the Mountain View campus. That's your corporate headquarters, right? Back, it's got to be about eight, nine years ago. And it is literally the one place I've been that looks most like a supervillain's lair, <laughs> complete with metal dinosaur. And this part I swear is true. I had two very lovely young people guiding me around, giving me a tour. One of the things they showed me was a concert hall on the campus with a lone piano. One of the, one of the young folks, unprompted, we didn't ask her to do this, nobody mentioned it, sat down and started playing, I believe it's called the Toccata in D minor, it's that Phantom of the Opera, da -na -na, da -na -da -na, music. The most evil thing you can play on a keyboard <laughs> instrument. Which does remind me, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the corporate motto of Google is, don't be evil. Do I have that correct? All right. And how many of you are evil? <sighs> Hands, fair enough. Uh, now the thing is, in the, the booming tech industry, I think it's a mistake to cut yourself off from a potential new kind of technology or a new realm of business. So if Google does ever consider going evil, I have some potential tech startups for it that might be positive avenues for them. So we're going to shark tank a few of them today. I'm going to bring you five great tech start. I'm sorry, I mean five great evil <laughs> tech startup opportunities. Take notes, and if you're in the corporate uh, department, my finder's fee is 20%. Number one, prosthetics. The prosthetics industry in America is increasing exponentially, and that fact is terrifying. Sales of prosthetic arms have gone up like 300% this year, and why, and who do we blame, and how do we stop that? But in the meantime, it's still a growing industry. And if you're going to look, uh, for your supervillain who is most likely to give you the in on prosthetics. We're going to go back 80 years to vicious Nazi super criminal, and I promise I won't often make you look at the technology of vicious Nazi super criminals, but we're going to look at the crane. Now you might ask yourself, what is a character called the crane used for prosthetics? Wings, a beak, knees that bend backwards? Nope. Extending telescoping arms. <laughs> And I know some of you might be interested or work on prosthetics and you were concentrating on haptics and neural feedback and instantaneous response. None of you thought about what it takes to reach stuff on the top shelf. <laughs> yeah. This is the one supervillain whose power is he never has to ask an associate for assistance. He can just get his little mini fridge for his dorm, check out, walk right out of Walmart. <laughs> to give more credit to the crane, and again, I'm not going to push too much Nazi technology on you, but uh, he has a second invention to his credit. The Nazi Saurus Rex. This is, <laughs> this is a metal dinosaur <laughs> beholden to the Nazi cause and is a robot driven by the crane. The most wonderful thing about comic books, by the way, is this is an image of a robot T Rex with a Nazi garter fighting a <laughs> naked stone giant in the middle of the ocean. 
And the giant has a tiny teenage king on his shoulder, and a man with telescoping arms are in the head of the dinosaur. And I don't feel like I need to explain this. <laughs> There's no context that will make it better. That's great. Uh, as a runner-up to the prosthetics industry, I do want to point out another character, the Mr. Pointer, who kills with the power of rudeness. Your mom told you not to do this. Uh, Mr. Pointer's hand is fake, or it exists, but it's not a hand as we think of it. It's hollow, and it contains a gun, but it's a special gun. It's a gun that shoots frozen slivers of poison at the speed of a bullet. This is a dangerous man to dap with. No, ah, that didn't work as well as I was hoping. Fair enough. Second field, wearables. This is a huge uh, technological opportunity these days. You've got your Fitbit, you have your watches, you have your Google Glasses, three pieces of technology I don't own. But if I did own them, I would very much want them to be what the dude wears. The dude is the best dressed villain in comic. In fact, he's dressed to kill. That's such a good joke, they put it right there. <laughs> Uh, just as an aside, the dude's nemeses were Bullet Man and Bullet Girl. These were police scientists who invented a metal they fashioned into a helmet that allowed them to fly and was hypermagnetic and so it attracted bullets. <laughs> That's a short-lived use at best. Uh, the, the dude had, uh, for instance here, he's got a hat with a razor sharp brim. He's got a cigarette holder that can shoot darts or gas. And he's got a cravat, which is just a really nice cravat. And the diamond pin explodes. Uh, a couple of the things he does do, uh, he has a boutonniere that shoots burning corrosive acid gas and cufflinks that shoot poison darts. It's always a big day in a young man's life when his father gives him his first pair of murderous dart cufflinks. Uh, another field you may have some interest in, adhesives. I know that's a little out of Google's range, but you can't let 3M have a throttle on that forever. Now, in the world of superheroics, who knows more about adhesives than your friendly neighborhood, wall-crawling, amazing, spectacular? Spider-Man. Who knows more? Spider-Man. Uh, <laughs> 20 years before Peter Parker worked, walked face first into an angry radioactive spider, Captain Marvel was facing this fella. Uh, his, I'll walk over here to point it out. He tells us that he <laughs> has invented a, an invention which squirts out plastic, which hardens into a sticky thread when it meets the air. And he learned this by watching spiders at work. Point of order, spiders know nothing of plastics. <laughs> Uh, also, if you ever do give up, don't be evil. Uh, I weave my webs of crime everywhere is a super good motto. <laughs> the uh, delivery vector that Spider-Man uses to uh, fire off his goop lacks a little finesse. It appears to be a pillow with a fire hose attached to it <laughs> or a crippled bagpipe. Uh, the most alarming thing about this sequence is that we learn in a single panel that Captain Marvel has had taffy all over his face at some point in his life. <laughs> Also, just to point, some of you aren't that clever. I know what that looks like, too. <laughs> looks like the top search category on Pornhub. Ooh, that one didn't go over well, either. <laughs> We're all a little embarrassed about the category search. Not a problem. I'll remember it. Number four, the Internet of Things. This has always been a huge focus of technology. We want every appliance and every piece of furniture to be interconnected so that our refrigerators can send nudes. But. Nobody does it. There was, just for the record, silent laughter. There's so much silent <laughs> laughter. That one worked. Uh, but your interconnectivity will never top that of Lord Lazy, or as I like to call him, Lord Lazy, like Jay-Z, because he's got 99 buttons. <laughs> he also looks real familiar. I think I see that guy in the mirror every morning when I shave. Still, Lord Lazy has a fiendish recliner with a sort of, uh, you know, frankly, children's attachable tray <laughs> full of buttons and devices. And he can do amazing things with these devices. He can send warships out over the capitals of the world. He can steal satellites. He can shoot lasers. Uh, and if there's something that requires the personal touch, he can send his robot double into effect. Now, I may not have the confidence of Lord Lazy, 
But if I had a robot double, I'd make him thinner. A little bit. Um, to give Lord Lazy a lot of credit, he's one of the few supervillains who in the course of fighting his, his foe, wins. This is him destroying the Washington Monument and the hero utterly helpless to do anything about it. Go Lord Lazy. Uh, however, Lord Lazy has a rack full of buttons. There is another villain who can get it all done with one, and that's Blor, <laughs> dictator of Uranus. <laughs> I, want to, I want to plead with you. If ever the word Uranus is not funny to you, stop laughing at everything. They're sending a probe to Uranus. You can see Uranus through this telescope. It's always funny. Uh, what can Bloor do with his single button? Well, let's walk through it. He can sound powerful sirens. He can launch entire fleets of rocket ships to conquer other worlds. He can make two huge robots appear, and apparently one not so huge robot. <laughs> if the caption had been bigger, it would have been two huge robots and one of the two huge robots' cousin. He came along, we didn't ask. But most importantly, he can Summon an Amazon regiment of fighting women. <laughs> Amazon is really reaching. That's one of the many things you can order with a push of a single button. And lastly, <laughs> doomsday weapons. This is an untested field. It's a great opportunity for Google to blaze a trail. What kind of doomsday weapons? Well, here's Dr. Dracula, part of a crew of, and we'll quote here, vampires as large as men. <laughs> Not sure how tall they normally are, <laughs> to be perfectly frank. Uh, Dr. Dracula doesn't invent anything, but he does steal a death ray from a, uh, an American scientist, a death ray that is hell on mice. And for that matter, if you've ever heard that smoking kills, it sure does if you're in the path of a death ray. <laughs> also armed with some beautiful death weapons is Mr. Hydro, the man made of spit. He's gross. Uh, he is a fellow capable of turning himself into water, and he has a habit of escaping down toilets, sinks, and drains. So my guess is he smells like laundry you forgot to take out of the wash for two days. Uh, he again steals his inventions, uh, created by this young fella here. This includes a death ray pistol, a disintegrator, and a gold maker machine, but luckily he locks it in a vault, a vault with a huge crack on the ceiling that you can slip through if you can turn to water. Nice job. And lastly, probably the best known inventor of a doomsday weapon, Lepus the Fiend. This is a creation of Fletcher Hanks, a creator that you should look up because he's bug nuts insane. Uh, I shall destroy all the civilized planets. How is he going to destroy all the civilized planets? With a ray. That's how I do it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is your list of potential new markets for Google to enter. Again, 20% finder's fee. Contact me after the show. I have most of these guys' numbers. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, this book is the second in a series mm -hmm. um, of books about superheroes. And how do you start writing these books? Uh, well, at this point, it's momentum. Uh, I've been writing about these weird characters since 1997. Uh, and a lot of, actually weirdly, a lot of the characters in the book do come from the blog, but I was able to find dozens more that I had never even, to be honest, heard of before I started doing the research. Um, also, like I mentioned in the intro, it sounds like after the blog, you went on This American Life mm -hmm. and then Quirk Books and so on. With, in, the, in your episode of This American Life, you had something where um, there's another piece in there where John Hodgman asked people about whether they'd rather the power of invisibility or flight. In that spirit, could you give us two regrettable superhero villain powers to choose between? I very much will, but I really want to ask everybody in the crowd. So the question is, this is John Hodgman, before he was famous, uh, asking if you could have either invisibility or the power of flight, which would you choose? How many people would want invisibility? And the power of flight? How many people want the power of invisibility so they can steal things? <laughs> There you go. How many people want the power of flight so they can save money on airplane tickets? <laughs> We're simple creatures. Um, there, are, uh, there are a couple I really like. I'm very fond of Batroc Zalipair, who is a French supervillain. Actually made it into one of the Captain America movies, bless his heart. 
He's a master of savate, which is a French foot fighting style. And he leaps uh, like a frog, which is where his name comes from. Of course, it's Batrock, as in Batrachian. Uh, and I'm very fond of not just his acrobatics, because obviously I'm not uh, doing cartwheels every day, uh, but I really love his giant handlebar mustache and the fact that he speaks with a Maurice Chevalier accent, <laughs> which I can never personally master myself. <laughs> oh, and then otherwise, uh, Swarm. Uh, comics are filled with people either made of or themed about bees. Swarm is, and do you mind if I tell a little story about Swarm, please? I want to tell you about Swarm because he has the most avoidable origin in the history of comic books. <laughs> uh, Swarm is a, formerly a Nazi horticulturalist who escapes Germany at the end of the war, goes to South America. One night he sees a meteor fly over his property. He goes and hunts it down. He finds that it's crashed next to a hive of killer bees. But the radiations from the meteor have made them docile, easy to command, and twice their normal size. Now, he is a Nazi hoping to reinvigorate the Fourth Reich and take over the world. And he has in front of him a meteor that makes its victims twice their size but completely docile and some fat bees who want to sleep. <laughs> and he thinks, I'm going to take the bees. And so he takes the bees back to his laboratory, and the first thing he wants to do is teach them to kill again, <laughs> which they do him. <laughs> and they, f they actually flense the flesh from his body, because these are industrious bees, and then they take over his body, and then he is a man made of bees, or I prefer <laughs> to call it a man made of Nazi bees. Now, I could very happily be made of democratic bees, I would much prefer that, but being made of bees seems to have some advantages. If you can name one, I'd be appreciative, but <laughs> mostly it's cool. Lots of honey. Lots of honey. So, so these may be hard to summarize, but I think frog legs or made of bees, right? Which, which frog? Would, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, bees. Yeah, bees, made I, of bees. I was actually fooling when I took a moment to think about it. Because <laughs> <laughs> the answer is bees, bees every time. Bees. My favorite superhero from the first book, if I can uh, zing oh. off, is a character called the Red Bee. This is a Golden Age character came out in the 1940s. I'll tell you before I tell you anything about him, he was obviously tongue-in-cheek. The creators used the pseudonym B.H. Apiary for his stories, the B.H. probably standing for Beehive. Still, the Red Bee was an assistant district attorney named Richard Raleigh, who was tired of criminals overrunning his city and taking advantage of the justice system, so he dressed up in a diaphanous shirt, stripy leggings, and went into battle with a single bee named Michael that <laughs> lived in his belt buckle. And when he was in trouble, click. <laughs> now you might be asking, what can a single bee do against crime? He can startle bad guys. He can sting bad guys. And one time when the red bee was tied up in a shack, uh, Michael escapes, finds a razor blade on a nearby table, brings it back to the red bee so he can cut himself free or reflecting on his life, maybe kill himself. <laughs> Um, we have an audience <coughs> question. Oh, hey. Hi. Uh, so it looks like um, a lot of the material you look at is um, from, you know, the Golden Age or earlier. Uh, do you have, who's your most favorite recent regrettable supervillain and superhero, actually? I don't know if you still read comics regularly. Uh, I do. You know, the, the number of comics I have to read for the books and for Gone and Forgotten and another comic book blog I write called The Chronological Superman means I, about 90% of my comic reading is really focused on the 40s through the 60s. <clears throat> uh, it's usually, there's always a nice redux to some characters. Uh, one of the characters in the book is called Modok. This is a giant head flying around in what appears to be a Japanese toilet <laughs> with his little arms hanging out the side. And he was always a difficult character to take seriously. In recent years, somebody realized, oh, that's actually kind of funny. And he's become more of a comedic villain. I really love that. Uh, and then, this is not a funny answer, but there's a superhero called The Vision. I think he's actually been in one of the Captain America movies. And he just got a great story by a writer named Tom King, and it's one of the best superhero comics I've ever read. So, now I couldn't think of a regrettable one there, but yeah. Oh, and Squirrel Girl, who was actually in the first book, and is now like the most popular superhero at Marvel. I'm gonna take a little credit for that, just a smidge. <laughs> let's, let's go for another audience yeah. question, since we have one. So when I look at your uh, your cover here, the 
one that stands out that inspires me the most is The Horrible Hand. Uh, I'm wondering if you could share with me the story behind that one. I would love to share my Horrible Hand. Um, the Horrible Hand is a villain, there's actually a factotum of a former wizard uh, and a foe of a character called Ibis the Invincible. Ibis had something called the Ibis Stick, which could make anything come alive and it would obey him, which is pretty good. Uh, and the Horrible Hand was a demon's hand that was summoned by one of Ibis' enemies to kill him. And mostly what he can do is like do the poking, the pushing, the choking, the usual hand stuff. So you probably could have just gotten a dude. Uh, the reason the hand is in here, besides the fact that it's a good graphic and it is a weird villain, is that in the first book, there was a character called the Eye, which was a giant, flaming, disembodied eye that would show up in people's bedrooms or their living rooms when they weren't expecting it, command them to fight evil, and then disappear. Uh, and I just thought between the two of them, that's a stupendous pairing, the Eye and the Hand, although I think the Eye probably is going to come out the worst. <laughs> Speaking of the cover, I, I love the cover. It, it feels very nostalgic to me with the whole little bin and all the white dots and all. It just reminds me of the old comics. How, how did you come up with these covers? Uh, well, I was working in conjunction with Tim O'Neill. He's the designer at Quirk Books. Uh, very young guy, just got out of design school, and Regrettable Superheroes was the very first thing he designed. So I'm super proud of him uh, and very, feel very blessed to have him be the designer on my book. I will say I got to contribute two things when we were putting this together. I said, can we make it look like a really old, worn comic book, and can we put a stripe there? Wow. And I'll count that as a credit. <laughs> <laughs> but why the stripe? Uh, on older comics, so one of my obsessions, I'll probably point out, is mastheads. I really love the design on old comic book mastheads. And one of the things they did for a while, each company has done stripes in one capacity or another. Um, big Marvel and DC when I say the companies, but also the old Golden Agers. Sometimes you just put that stripe because when you're looking at a rack of comics, you really only see about that much of the comic and all that's below the cover. Uh, and then if you've got a bunch of comics on the rack, sometimes you only see this much of the cover. So companies used to put little pictures of the characters there. They would put the title there. Sometimes they would just put a colored strip. There was a, a company called Red Band and Red Band always had their red band on there so you could always pick them out of the crowd. I always like those. Cool. Another audience. So a question more meta about the book. You've Ooh. been writing this, this blog for 20 years now, and you've really kind of carved out a niche of this, this subject matter expert of an unusual subject area. I like to think so. Um, so just for other people kind of interested in pursuing oddball passions and fixations and things like that to their logical extremes, uh, could you talk a little bit about how you got into this in the first place and how you've carried it through all these years? Uh, I will say the number, one, the number one technique for carrying it all the way through 20 years is periodically say you're going to take a month off and stretch that out to three years. <laughs> uh, bless Gone and Forgotten, I've always enjoyed doing it, but sometimes life gets in the way a little bit and I have probably out of the 20 years taken about seven years off. But still, um, <laughs> uh, it helps to have a crew of folks to test yourself against because you will always find other people with weird obsessions. Uh, Andrew Otis Weiss, uh, Matt, Matt Maxwell, I blanked on his name, and Chris Sims over at Comics Alliance also always do these kind of weird comic book things, and it's really great to bounce off of them. Also, if you can get an enemy in the field, that is hugely helpful <laughs> because you look at what they do, and then sometimes you're like, mm, I can be funnier about that very same book. <laughs> and you just try to, try to bury him a little. <laughs> Uh, not, the, not the friendliest advice, but it's really good <laughs> advice. Okay, another audience question. In the recent Lego Batman movie, there was a throwaway, uh, throwaway joke about all the bad Batman villains that have come out in the, the past. Do you feel like you've influenced this? Have they contacted you and asked, hey, can you come up with a list of weird supervillains we used to have? Um, I think there's been a real turn towards enjoying the goofier villains because we have been kind of darker and darker. When Tim Burton did Batman, Actually, we'll do Tim Burton did Batman, and when uh, Richard Donner did Superman, their villains, played by big celebrities, were kind of fun still. There was something kind of wacky and weird. Even Batman Returns, which has Danny DeVito turning an amazing, creepy, gross performance, it's still kind of funny and over the top and campy. Um, but what other 
TV and movie producers took from that is trying to make it darker and darker and grimmer and grimmer. And I think this is just backlash. I think we now like the idea of really goofy supervillains because you can only take really grim stuff for so long before you want to see something that makes you laugh a little bit. When I first hear the term regrettable here, it just sounds like something that somebody wishes they hadn't done. But mm -hmm. that isn't quite the meaning, I think, you meant for this. What, what, what do you mean by regrettable supervillains? Almost everybody in here, I like to think, had the potential to become something great. And actually, a few of the, the characters in the book are still used and are still popular. Batrock, Modoc, a couple of characters I mentioned, still show up in the comics. I think there's a good chance Modoc's going to be in an upcoming Iron Man or Captain America movie. Um, but for the most part, some vagary of the market or a failing publisher or just being buried in the back of an anthology title kept a lot of these characters from reaching any kind of potential or reaching a big audience. And then there are some that are genuinely awful. But <laughs> they are the minority in the book. I always try to find something that celebrates about them because I'd like to see all of them in one fashion or another come back. Oh, um, so, so you mentioned some that are gen genuinely awful. Um, yeah. Which could you name a few of those? Okay. For fun. So. Uh, comics, of course, are influenced by the current events and about our, our culture. And we, are, we were at war, I guess we are at war, but we were at war uh, with Germany and Japan back in the 40s, so you got a lot of Japanese villains who were awful, uh, just terrible racial caricatures. And then during the Red Scare, a lot of Chinese supervillains who were equally awful. And there is one called Egg Fu, who is a 40-foot tall egg with a giant prehensile mandarin mustache who could use it to he beats up wonder woman he actually kills wonder woman in this story but it's a comic book so she's she's back um and he was he was one of those things where he would reverse his r's and his l's and he had buck teeth and he had yellow skin and it was it was a grotesque thing to look at and the problem with him is they keep trying to bring the, the second problem with it is <laughs> they keep trying to bring him back in some fashion or another. He was brought back in the 90s and it was meant to be like, let's be ironic about the racism, not that good. And then a very good writer named Grant Morrison brought him back, didn't call him Egg Fu, made him an egg shaped weird scientist from another planet. And it worked until someone called him Egg Fu, and then all of the associations come flooding back. So, kind of wouldn't I, if Egg Fu disappeared from the planet tomorrow, it wouldn't be wouldn't be bad. Nobody would suffer. Um, some some villains probably made it, even though they had the chance to be regrettable. Um, mm -hmm. what, which ones do you think slid through that little thin line there? Whatever. I'm pro I might make enemies. Um, <laughs> and if it's too sensitive, we can skip that. <laughs> as, a, as a really big Superman fan, I think I, um, I was prejudiced against putting any of his villains in, even though a lot of them are major goofballs. Uh, his most important, one of his most popular villains through his entire run is a character called Mr. M Mr. McJespedlick from the fifth dimensional land of Zerf. And he's a funny little man in a derby, and he's got magic powers, and I love him, and I think he's a great character, but he, is, he looks ridiculous next to the most powerful mortal being in the universe, and he still wins, which is great. Uh, there's a character called the Prankster, who's a pencil-necked, pumpkin-bodied guy who pulls pranks, scams, and cons, and he always gets the best of Superman. And I'll tell you this one. He's the first villain to knock Superman unconscious, and here's how he did it. He frustrated Superman, got under his skin. He irritated him so much that against his better judgment, Superman hauled off and threw a legitimate super punch at the prankster's head, a shot that would have killed him if the prankster hadn't ducked. And Superman's fist goes all the way around and <laughs> knocks him out flat. Uh, and there's also Terra Man, who was a space cowboy, and he had weapons like radioactive tumbleweeds, or he had a tobacco pouch that was a grenade, and he flew on a Pegasus. And, I, oh, and he's based off of Clint Eastwood. And I kind of love him, so couldn't put him in. But yeah, he's made, he's made it. And there were a few villains that, that as a parent, I could, as a, a parent mm. of a teenage girl, I could kind of relate to. I mean, there was Tino, the terrible teen, Sinestro, boy fiend. Uh, boy fiend? Yeah, which, you know, boyfriend, boy fiend, what's <laughs> the difference? What's yeah, that? if you've got a teenage daughter, they're all boy fiends. Yeah. yeah. Uh, comics of course, are really reflexive of culture and whatever seems to be scary and menacing becomes a villain. 
And you have to keep in mind these were all being written and drawn by men in their 40s and 50s. And they must have looked at, you know, the Beatles scene and the mods and just went, oh, these kids. And actually made villains out of teenagers, which is sort of the opposite of what you want to do for your market. <laughs> uh, full, teenagers love being told they're monsters. Um, so yeah, Tino the Terrible Teen was the biggest rock star in the world who ended up hating the Challengers of the Unknown because secretly his brother was a member of the Challengers who was murdered. And so he used his powerful empire of rock music to attack the Challengers of the Unknown, which is the perfect thing that a 50-year-old thinks a young kid would use as weapon, is his like, oh, they got that rap music, and they're on my lawn. <laughs> Uh, well, is that it? That's about it. Thank you very oh, much well, for coming. You got a question? What? Oh, no, sorry, just... one other question. Um, <laughs> just, you could say uh, it, we'll repeat it up here. What would you say is probably your favorite villain? I mean, since you're always looking at like, what makes it bad, what makes it really good. Ooh, uh, I'll, um, I'll repeat it for the recording. Yeah, please what, do. What's your favorite villain? Uh, so I'm a big fan of anyone who gets a little morally ambiguous. Because villainy is great, and it's wonderful to have like a big, over-the-top, campy, arch, uh, or even Grand Guignol kind of like exciting villain, but it's great when they get into a villain's head a little bit. Lex Luthor started off his, his first 25 years of his existence as just Luthor, the evil scientist, the war profiteer. Uh, in 19, <clears throat> I think it's 1959, and I should know this because I just wrote about it, uh, he gets a backstory, and it turns out he and Superman were friends when they were teenagers. And it was an accident that Superboy caused that made him lose his hair and turn evil. Uh, which happens. <laughs> and then this became a story really about the potential of this young boy genius and how it was wasted on this meaningless feud and for his ego. And how it really destroyed what could potentially have been someone who saved the world. That's a really good background. Um, there's also a character named Bullseye who fights Daredevil very often. And he started off as just like all supervillains do. He's got a costume and a gimmick and a name. But the more they interacted, the more we learned about Bullseye has mental illnesses and Bullseye has hallucinations. And Bullseye had a promising career, but he just has these commands and voices and sees things and he has to listen to them. And it made him more sympathetic while making him a little more terrifying because the fear of losing control is always like a big fear for everybody. There's a couple. Just waiting to see if anybody else stands up quickly. Looks like we have one more. We got one more. No respect for chairs. <laughs> um, so I'll admit that I have spent very, very little time of reading comic books. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> Get um, I don't know a lot about the culture, but some of these just seem very, very out there. Is that like do, are people going for kind of these these weird characters, or is it like? a function of having to come up with so many villains that they just come out weird and sometimes fall flat. That, that is it. Um, so a couple things happened. A lot of the characters I discussed today were all from the Golden Age. And there were no rules. They had just made up the genre. So everything was possible, nothing was forbidden. That's how you get a flaming hand that just pokes people out of windows. Uh, because no one says, that's a little goofy, run with it. Uh, but yeah, we change our attitudes every decade or so, and the audiences want something different. Um, I'm really shocked that the Joker continues to be a very popular villain, because he was very good for the 80s, where we were really into bloodshed, and we wanted the villains to be super bad and evil. And he, he had a good comeback in the, in the 2000s, right after September 11th, because we were again looking for really uh, objectively evil characters. And I feel like we're kind of, well, we do have some objectively evil characters we have to deal with in real life. But I feel like in fiction, we should be a little beyond that. Um, but yeah, the, the other thing you said about having to make so many, either of the big two companies produces 60, 70, 80, 90 titles a month. And if you're a writer, you've got to crack through every third, fourth issue, you've got to have somebody new. So they're just creating them hand over fist. There was a trend in the 1960s uh, and 70s because editors usually are the, the people who flesh out the ideas and sometimes name the characters. There was a flood of characters who were clearly named after things you could just see on a desk. <laughs> there was the eraser who got mentioned before. Uh, there was the human eraser. There's Calendar Man who was mentioned. Just, uh, I'm sure there was a paperclip somewhere. 
Oh, there's something called paste pot peat. <laughs> uh, uh, it even sounds like um, Spider-Man was considered one of these that was like a throwaway character. Like Stanley's publisher is like, no way. It's spiders. People hate spiders. It's a teenager. <laughs> we can't have teenagers and all. Yeah, him making Spider-Man a teenager was a huge deal. This was, it's not unprecedented. There were teenage and, and child heroes in the 1940s and 50s. But making it a teenager into whose head you could go and really see, you know, Stan was channeling his own teenage fears. He was pretty young. He'd been writing comics at 14 back in the, in, uh, the Golden Age or 16. So, uh, but yeah, the, the story behind all of Marvel Comics falls down to a guy named Martin Goodman, who was the president of the company, who would go golfing with the guys who ran what we know now as DC Comics. And they were golfing one day, and, and the president of DC was just bragging, oh, this comic book Justice League, oh, it's great, it's only, well, it's, we couldn't be selling more. So Goodman went right into the offices, knocked on his nephew Stan Lee's door and says, give me a Justice League, and walks out. And then Stan creates Fantastic Four, and he creates Spider-Man and the Hulk, and with the assistance, of course, of Jack Kirby and Don Heck and all these other great creators, and Steve Ditko, of course, and creates a phenomenon because basically Martin Goodman had a bad day golfing. <laughs> Other audience. So there's a lot of stories in the Golden Age in particular where the superheroes were not very well defined and they ended up with changed powers or, mm. or that sort of thing. But I'm not aware of any villains that have had that drastic change. Are you aware hmm. of any? Uh, <laughs> so there's a villain called the Ultra Humanite, uh, which is a great name. Uh, and he started off as actually Superman's first arguable super villain. Superman, when he debuted, went about a year and a half just fighting crooks and finks and jerks. Uh, the Ultra Humanite, when he shows up as Superman's physical opposite, he's an old, wiry, creaky dude, and he naturally dies at the hands of one of his own evil plots. But he comes back about a year later because his assistants have transported his body, his brain, into the body of a young Hollywood actress named Dolores Winters, which makes, by the way, the Ultra Humanite the first transgender character in comics. Pack that one away for bar trivia night, it might come in. <laughs> Frankly, the editorship and the audience were a little not sold, because this was, again, the 1940s, on a man's brain and a woman's body. So they transplant him to uh, a more, more palatable body, which is a giant, weird, mutant monkey creature. <laughs> uh, so his tremendous intellect is still his power, but now, of course, he has the physical power of, of a, a giant, weird monkey. That, um, that's a real drastic version. There are powers that change periodically. Poison Ivy, one of Batman's foes, is a really good example because when she debuted, she was just a master of poison. And so she would scratch people and poke people. She had the poison lipstick gag, which is always in comics because you got to have a way for boys to kiss the girls. Um, but now she controls plants and she makes evil plants and now she can make plants to her commands because someone basically just looked at that costume and said, oh, it's got to be a plant creature, and just wrote it, and nobody corrected them, and now she controls plants. <laughs> um, so you mentioned one of the things that makes having a really you know, focused position on this uh, easier is having an enemy. Is that, uh, I, I don't know, like if they're actual enemies, you probably don't want to you know, share stories, but if it's like a frenemy relationship, do you have any good stories of, of competitions you've done with people? Uh, my, my closest frenemy is Chris Sims over at Comics Alliance, uh, which started because he's been trying to get one of these books published for decades. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tough luck, Chris. But um, uh, I don't have a story about the rivalry. I usually just I bust on him a little on, on podcasts, and he busts a little on me. Um, my favorite Chris Sims story is he's, he's in West Virginia or North Carolina, somewhere that I don't know what states look like in that part of the country. <laughs> and um, Despite that, I was at an Aaron Brothers buying some frames and I heard two of the clerks talking. I heard one of them say, uh, I have an opinion about the new Spider-Man movie, but I'll keep it short, I'm not Chris Sims here. Which is amazing to me that people were just dusting him that as far as I was aware, never met him. So that's one of my favorite, uh, he doesn't believe me, but that's a true story and I want you to pass it around if you'd be so kind. Um, but there's another one where there was a, it's a pretty famous comic creator who actually whose work I really appreciate and really liked. When I was a kid, I used to copy him. And he started doing a wacky comics thing. And I was just chatting with him about it. And uh, his was monthly and mine was three times a week. And I mentioned that and he got real angry. And I can't remember what he said, but it was really snide. And I just decided, next year is dedicated to burying you. 
<laughs> I'm going to take the nuclear option. <laughs> so, on all the examples I can think of, the name on the top of the comic book is the hero, right? The villain. Um, and villains also tend to be associated only with one hero. They don't like move from place to place. I'm wondering if you know of any examples where a villain has managed to transcend that mm -hmm. to become bigger than just one um, one hero. Sure. Or to get their name on the top. Uh, if you are planning on seeing the Justice League of America is just Justice League, isn't it? Justice League movie. Darkseid, the big bad guy in that, was originally created just to be part of this little enclosed universe of characters uh, created by the great Jack Kirby. And he kind of filtered out into the Superman universe, and then he filtered out into the Justice League universe. Now he's the big bad guy for everybody. Uh, Kingpin is another character who you probably saw him on the Netflix show. Uh, he started off as a Spider-Man film, and he kind of transplanted, transplanted over. And I will mention, too, there's a lot of villains who get their own books. In fact, in the 70s, they were so popular, still writing on the Batman 66 wave, that there was a book called The Secret Society of Supervillains that featured 25, 30 of these characters, all, by the way, all dressed in weird costumes, all with explosive powers. One of them was a giant monkey, and they were still secret. Um, <laughs> but the Jokers had his own book. Catwoman, Harley Quinn have had their own books. Uh, Kingpin just got a title. Lex Luthor has had a book. They get their they get their props and dues every now and again. So last question. Oh boy. Uh, okay. Yeah, you mentioned Modoc as an example of a super super villain who was originally supposed to be serious, but then they realized he's silly and made him silly. Are there, uh, can you think of any examples of a super villain who who start, who started out being silly, but then they decided that he was actually more serious than intended? Sure. Um, that is the story of the 1980s. Uh, <laughs> particularly in DC Comics, they had an event called the Crisis on Infinite Earths. It was their 50th anniversary. They created a huge, complicated uh, continuity <clears throat> with multiple universes and multiple versions of single heroes. And it was incredibly confusing to everyone who didn't grow up reading them since they were five. Uh, so they simplified and streamlined everything. And that involved making a lot of the villains much more terrible. Uh, Mr. McDead's Pitalik I mentioned earlier, who was a funny little imp who would torment Superman with magic. Actually, after being tricked out of the universe the first time, comes back furious that he's been tricked because that wasn't playing the game right, and he becomes a legitimate menace. Um, I'm blanking on one that was a really good example, so you tell me. Oh, no, that's okay. The Penguin, <laughs> uh, again, started off in a little tuxedo after, after 1987, after the crisis. He comes back as a dude with filed down teeth, and he's a cannibal. That's unnecessary. <laughs> uh, I'm okay with the tuxedo. Again, that was probably inspired by Danny DeVito's performance. But yeah, they, they, do, they did amp them up and make them a lot more evil. And there is a comic called Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow, uh, written by Alan Moore. And it's supposed to be the final Superman story. And it brings back all of his villains. And there's a, a pretty famous line from it after one of his oldest friends is killed by two of his silliest villains. And it's when the menaces come back as murderers, what are the murderers going to come back as? Which, not just a, a chilling line, but really an excoriating statement for what comics had become by the late 80s. That's well, it? thank you very much for oh, coming thank you. and joining us. Very much.